so welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where we share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at EPCC. My name is Dr. Jules Simon, and I'm a philosopher and teach philosophy at the University of Texas, El Paso. And today we're really pleased to have with us as our guest, uh, Evan Lopez, who is the education curator for the University of Texas at El Paso Centennial Museum and Chihuahuan Desert Gardens. His educational background is in philosophy and Latin American and border studies. His research interests are in U.S.-Mexico border ontology, border epistemology, critical border studies, and more recently, museum education in the context of the U.S.-Mexico border. He has presented his work at several academic conferences, including uh, at a conference in India and this, at the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy Conference. Thank you for being with us today, Evan. Thank you for having me. All right, Evan, so we know your training is in border studies. How, how is border studies different from history or philosophy? I guess, like, what is border studies? So yeah, my educational background is in Latin American and border studies, but also philosophy. Uh, Latin American border studies is a, an interdisciplinary approach to studying the U.S.-Mexico border with that of the broader Latin American study. It is, uh, it's different because instead of um, focusing on the historical, we focus more on the social and it is heavily concentrated in social science research methodologies, you know, anthropo anthropological research methodologies, uh, sociological research methodologies like uh, ethnography. But also uh, what I do is I apply philosophy to study uh, the border, uh, particularly and uh, Latin American uh, in general. Um, Instead of doing archival work like uh, many historians do or historiography, I apply the social science to study border. So how, like, how do you use philosophy to do border studies? So one of my interests, as mentioned earlier, is in critical border studies. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of philosophical concepts to study border phenomena. Uh, particularly, I'm interested in uh, the way the border functions for uh, different types of people. Um, for example, I use phenomenology as one of the one of the ways to, you know, get that specific, uh, I guess, the border specificities of the way the border functions for people, and also uh, critical theory to to analyze the border. I, w I have a couple more questions for sure. those of you who know more about this than me. What is phenomenology and then what is critical theory? So I like uh, Marlou Ponty's uh, uh, definition of phenomenology. For him, phenomenology is the study of experiences uh, without being verified by scientific or, or rational academic uh, uh, justifications. So critical theory is a way to <clears throat> study society with a postmodern approach to to the social sciences instead of taking but at the same time critiquing these uh, mo these models of, of analysis. Um, it it incorporates, you know, the study of, of race, the study of, of systems of oppression, and so on. And then, uh, do you want to ask the next question? Because I, then I would ask also, what is postmodern? <laughs> you keep pecking away there. Go, go, go ahead, Kim. So <clears throat> there's many, many, uh, I guess, explanations or definitions for what postmodern is. For me, postmodern is. Uh, a sort of uh, analysis to study the the meta narratives. It breaks down the totalization of ideas that have been set up by uh, you know the Enlightenment thinkers or or other philosophers. It brings in lots of ways to 
study society. Phenomenon of post-modernity depends upon then how we understand what is modernity, mm -hmm. right? And modernity is often used as a kind of historical category. So there's the modern period, the medieval period, the mm -hmm. ancient period, right? And I, I know the, the term postmodern came about because of this philosopher named Lyotard, a French, French philosopher. Um, and he did talk about the ways that um, we need to be critical of meta narratives, as you put it, mm -hmm. right? But a lot of those meta narratives come, come about because of the way that we emerged from these major historical movements like the Enlightenment or like rationalism, right? And this focus on rationalism. So the next question has to do with why is it important? Um, and I want to ask the fourth question before no, the third one. No, no, no. You've got to go in order. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask. Why is it I, important? I, I wanted to ask. Number eight. Yeah. All right. No, All right. I'm going in order. All right. I, we will order. follow. We will follow your orderly, <laughs> orderly progression. But look, you know, we can stay on the postmodern and that's number two, which is how does living on the border influence our perspective of history? Because um, there is that meta narrative mm -hmm. of history, right? Yeah. Um, of U.S. history, of Mexican history. Mm-hmm but it's a little different here on the border. Yeah, so that's kind of where I was going anyway. Okay, how would you ask that question? Um, well, what, what does, uh, I was gonna actually push into the, the question about um, Evan's role as a, as a curator of a museum and museum education, and how then do you incorporate that kind of meta narrative that we understand about the border in your work in, as a as a curator in a museum. So there's mm -hmm. lots of ways to think about that relationship of postmodern to modern mm -hmm. and what that kind of transition looks like. But I think, as Kim mentioned, it takes a specific shape being on the border here. It does. So how does living on the border influence our perspective of history? So I could only speak for myself, but it influences my perspective of history uh, because after, you know, researching, reading, uh, studying history, studying philosophy, studying border studies, I am aware of the dominant and the hegemonic narrative that is used to talk about the border, to, to produce knowledge about the border. So I am very careful and very critical of these dominant uh, narratives and their interpretations. So <clears throat> I think it's important to also highlight the fact that a lot of border histories have been omitted or neglected. So an example, uh, going back to the, the museum, my museum position as an educational curator, we have a very uh, how would I say it, authentic approach to tell these stories. We currently have an exhibit, uh, it's uh, Pasos Ajenos, Social Justice uh, and Inequalities in the Borderlands. And it's a counter narrative to the dominant uh, historical narratives of the borderlands. And to go back to the way history is presented, there is an installation in that exhibit that talks about Carmelita Torres. She was a 17-year-old uh, girl who in the er, 1900s, early 1900s, mid, uh, you know, the, to the teens, she would cross every day to El Paso. She was from Juarez. She would cross every day to work as a maid um, here in El Paso. During that time, uh, there was a scare of typhoid. So all the people crossing from Juarez would have to go through these inhumane and degrading processes of sanitation. Uh, one day she decided that she was not going to go through that, uh, you know, inhumane and uh, degrading process. They would get like pesticides. Yeah, they would be sprayed right? with chemicals and uh, pesticides. 
Uh, and they would also be, uh, these women were also subjected to being photographed. And a lot of these photographed were then displayed in bars here in El Paso without their consent or knowing that they mm -hmm. were being, you know, uh, photographed. So she decided that she wasn't going to go through this process, and she resisted and protested, convincing other women to do the same. Several hours later, there was <clears throat> thousands of people who joined the protest, and uh, they, that's what we know as the Bath Riots. And it takes a very specialized uh, college uh, historical course, like uh, a class in Mexican-American history or in Chicano studies to learn about this where we don't learn about this in the K through 12 mm -hmm. uh, educational system. So it's important to highlight these stories and to know uh, about our history in order to, to you know, navigate these systems of, of oppression. That was a really great answer. <laughs> and let me say why, Evan. Um, because even though you said you didn't formally study historiography and historical method and things like that, what you're doing phenomenologically and with critical social theory is you're already looking at alternative ways to graph history or to understand historical uh, conditions. Because in phenomenology, um, one of the primary fo foci is to come up with the best possible description of one's experiences, mm -hmm. right? So that's one, one, one way to think about that. And if we don't include stories like um, Carmelitas, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're not coming up with the most adequate or most complete story, mm -hmm. right? Because they get left out. And the reason for that has to do with questions later on well, about politics and ethics. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask the next question. So then this is how, right? The previous question is how, how living on the border influences how we look at history. We're, we're aware of these omissions that don't are not taught in regular classes. And so the next question is bringing maybe more balance between the two. Is it important or why is it important to study history in general and then the border history in particular? So it's important to study history in general because <clears throat> it's good to know the way ideas have formed through time mm -hmm. and the way ideas have changed through time, but also the way changes occurred through time. It's important to learn how we as a society developed and particularly how our knowledge you know developed so for me it's particularly important to study border history uh, first because of my academic interest but also because I am from here and in order for me to I guess more fully understand my geographic region where I'm a native to I think that studying border uh, history is important not only that i think it's also important because as an education curator for el paso's first museum where we celebrate the stories of the border and the chihuahuan desert it's important for me to accurately interpret those stories in our e exhibitions i want to follow up on this accurate interpretation um i've you know i've only i only took my general electives that I had to take for history, so I'm not well versed in history. But I remember, so and I grew up here on the border too, but I remember having a, an insight where um, here in El Paso we have Porfirio Diaz Avenue, I think it's called, right? Mm -hmm. And so typically we tend to name streets after people we respect, and mm -hmm. right, Porfirio mm -hmm. Diaz Avenue. But then um, I was an undergrad and I was starting studying a little bit about uh, Mexican history or, you know, reading on El Porfiriato. And Porfirio Diaz on the Mexican side, I mean, you know, he, he was a mixed bag. 
yeah. mixed reviews there because he yeah. was a dictator mm -hmm. and we had to he ended up you know getting exiled <laughs> you know like Mexicans at the end of I don't know how many years of a dictatorship um, finally got rid of him but um, interesting how if I had not done my own research on this I would have thought that Porfirio Diaz was this great guy mm -hmm. right this great Mexican president or whatever mm -hmm. and so it's just interesting how from on one side of the border you get this streets named after this the same person and on the other side yeah uh, no this guy got exiled because he um, didn't do right by his by his country mm -hmm. you know and that just you know I think recently uh, about a couple years ago uh, we had a name here uh, Robert E. Lee mm-hmm and yeah. we know the history behind that and luckily the city took action and changed the name I don't know what it's called now but the street was named after a confederate uh, general right yeah, yeah. And that comes this this so you have like um, professionally and academically you have three different hats you wear there's this phenomenologist hat right where you're coming up with the best possible description of both subjective and objective mm -hmm. ways to think about personal your your experience, right? But uh, in order to do that, you have to be aware of what these narratives are, the meta narratives. Um, and it's not just enough to repeat the narratives, um, as you've already demonstrated to us. The ways that you practice critical theory then enter into your considerations because. You already with Carmelita's story, you you shared with us this kind of ethical twist that you get from critical social theory, right? So it's not just knowing the narratives, it's knowing what are the ethical problems that you need that we need to be critical of. And so having said that, I want to come come back to this other point that I that I've been wanting to get to is how, given that, um, do you see, uh, you gave us one example with Carmelita's, Carmelita's story, how do you see other kinds of activities that you do as curator raising that level of education for people? Because the Porfirio Diaz Street is a good example mm -hmm. because the everyday citizen travels that street and it's their everyday street knowledge, right? So they don't know that the guy yeah. was a brutal dictator at one point. Well, yeah. I, I, I'm gonna interrupt and then, you know, the re one of the reasons why the U.S. named this street after Porfirio Diaz is because Porfirio Diaz was allowing the U.S., you know, they engaged in trade. And so there is the, the ethical, the political, right? So the U.S. was I forget exactly like what the specifics of the trade, but of course the U.S. was benefiting from Profilio Diaz being in power, and so named the street after him. So it wasn't just like, this guy's a great guy. There was economic and political benefit at the expense of the Mexican people. You know? Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but these are the kind of broad themes that you potentially can take up in your new New position. You're relatively new position. Yeah. I know you've been there for several yeah. months now. Yeah. So, <clears throat> going back to that question, uh, as you go into the museum in the foyer, there's a big mural of, it's called Los Conquistadores. And mm -hmm. we all know the history of the Conquistadores and the brutality that they brought. So, we commissioned a uh, an artist, uh, his name is Diego Medina. He's a Piro Manso Tiwa from Las Cruces. And we commissioned him to do a response to that mural. Wow. So he's currently uh, about a little bit more than halfway done with the mural. And it's, uh, there's no specific um, story to the mural, but it's a, it's a way to counter that, that mural from, I think it's Salvador Lopez of the Conquistadores. 
So it's, it's a response and it's a pan-Indigenous mural celebrating all the Indigenous people from this region. And we are going to do educational programs for that. So we'll be programming it uh, uh, educationally and inviting students and uh, the public to come and check out the mural. And you know we're going to have didactic labels to tell the story of how this mural came about. Can we have a point of conversation? Yeah. Well, but, 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 but more than that, I really like that example you just gave us because I asked you about what's come, you know, in some way what's coming up or what you've been planning and working on, right? It's, you said, so it, there's no special story to his response. But what it is, is, is it's um, a physical installation, mm -hmm. right? Which is a lot of what you have to deal with at a museum. Yeah. Right? So you're, it's a special role that museums play in how they present yeah. um, the, the meta-narrative, but also responses to the narratives, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that that's a, a really important um, example you gave us because um, rather than dictating to the spectator what their response is, you set up this counter exhibition to then demonstrate this other perspective, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we and so you you allow the embodied perceiver, the spectator, yeah, to come to their judgment, their yeah. own critical we judgment. Yeah, we invite them to come in and right check it out for themselves and develop their own ideas for themselves without you know dictating on what they supposed to feel or, or see or interpret the exhibits. I was thinking, I wonder if the city of El Paso is going to put up a, a counter statue right. by the airport, right? To yeah. follow yeah. your footsteps. Yeah, well, we just hope they do, but. Right, yeah. I mean, they would be the right thing to do. I think so. Well, more concretely, you know, maybe give us a little, uh, because you know, phenomenology is a first person sort of uh, uh, discipline, philosophical discipline. so. Maybe you could just share with us how you came to be a curator. You know, what, what attracted you to that kind of a position in the first place? You know, because of your background? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I, before taking on this position, I was a high school social studies teacher over at Socorro High School. I was there for a couple of months and I didn't like the way uh, I was being micromanaged specifically by the state and what to teach, what not to teach, how to teach it, mm -hmm. and submitting lesson plans so I could, so they could, the administration could see how, how I was teaching the students, and I didn't like that. So, uh, luckily, this position opened. Uh, I got lucky and uh, I got the interview, and I think it's specifically because of my background in philosophy and border studies that I was able to land this uh, spot, this position as an education curator for the Centennial Museum. Yeah. And now, uh, what are your plans? Uh, this is off the script, right? Yeah. But what are your plans now that you have this position? So my plans is to, you know, pursue a doctoral degree. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of doing it in education and um, Doing something with museums, uh, philosophy and border studies, connecting all, mm -hmm. all three areas, and how to make m museums more relevant to our specific the specific demographic here in El Paso. I've noticed that a lot of the students who visit the museum have never been to a museum. I think that's their first museum that they visit, and. Uh, they don't even know about the Centennial Museum. So when I go and talk to students and invite them, and when we do our outreach uh, initiatives, they don't have a clue that that museum exists. They, they it's just a pretty building. It's just a very pretty building, an old pretty building. So I invite them to check it out, and uh, they are they're amazed that they have a uh, this great educational resource in their campus, and they like it. And one of the things that I wanna do more with the museum is to create exhibits on how uh, students, uh, students here in the U.S.-Mexico border can relate. Mm -hmm. For them, for, for them, them, for their history. For their history, yes. But I, I really like the, the, 
the way that <laughs> heaven's been responding to us. I mean, he has very concrete sorts of uh, you know, very concrete sorts of plans that you want to mm -hmm. uh, accomplish and engage um, and engage the public with. And I was thinking, you know, people don't go to museums, and we have good museums. Yeah. You know, past we have the art museum, we have the history museum, the Holocaust museum, mm -hmm. the Centennial Museum. And a bit of a neglected the museum, yeah, the, the international museum, which is a bit neglected, right? Um, it's in the process of being revived. It. We also have the archaeology museum. That's that right. It's a small museum, but it's it's a very good museum. They have a very good collection that you know, tells again the story of. It's more focused to, you know, the the indigenous people who are here, and they have a very good collection to uh, tell those stories. Oh, this is so inspiring now we want to like just visit all the museums. Yeah, well, I guess my question is this as an educational curator, um, one thing that you one one issue that you have to grapple with is how do we get the public, not just students but the public in general, more involved in what's going on in a museum mm -hmm. and and you know, and and to be able to be exposed to these kinds of different mm -hmm. historical, social perspectives, social and cultural perspectives, right? So, do you offer them pan dulce? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Apple cider. Yeah. So that's one of the, that's one of my goals. That's that's what I want to make them attractive. Yeah. Like how do we make the, a, a museum an attractive yeah. place? So lately, I've been. You know, outreaching to professors and uh, mm. department heads, and um, EPCC uh, with the uh, Tejano Passport Program, mm -hmm. um, inviting the students. You know, ha working with the students on giving them extra credit to visit the museum. I've been noticing that students who go to the museum to receive extra credit, they end up coming back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's working with teachers. Uh, the, the the public schools and just outreaching mm -hmm. so but I've, I've I've noticed that what works is you know reaching out to these professors and you know also educating them of the exhibits that we have on display and uh, how they could relate to their curriculum mm -hmm. and sending the students over I'm gonna ask the next question go for it um, well, the question is, can we trust historical accounts? For instance, the history of the American continent is told differently by Europeans mm -hmm. and American Indians or Africans, right? Ameri African Americans. So um, what do you think? Can we trust historical accounts? I think it depends. I think uh, it depends on what historical account we are uh, reading. Um, I tend to trust the historical accounts that offer nuance and specificities of societies uh, throughout time. I tend to really trust oral histories because it allows for subjectivity and voice to come into play. It allows for the people themselves to be historical uh, agents and and you know, to be historical agents in their their history and also in their, their epistemic making. Mm -hmm. So those are the accounts that I tend to gravitate to when researching, um, you know, specific events, uh, uh, public history, and things like that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take on the role of Kim now. All right. <laughs> I'm going to channel a little bit of Kim. So what, how do you understand... Uh, well, epistemic production, for one, because epistemic's a funny word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, is, what does it mean? Yeah, what does it mean? But the other one, the other one which, because that question bleeds into the next question, right, uh, about objectivity and subjectivity, you know, and distinguishing those, those poles of epistemic yeah. production. Yeah, so what is right? epistemology? Well, and the relationship of, your, of one's subjectivity to that kind of trust in objective accounts as... What is, what is epistemology? Evan's gonna answer. <laughs> so the straightforward and simple question is the 
the analysis of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Where do we attain that knowledge? How do we use that knowledge? Yes. And so on. Mm -hmm. And we could take it in many other ways. And so when you mean epistemic production, what yes. do you mean by that? So I mean that they are agents in their knowledge production. They themselves create the knowledge that is going to be used to, you know, analyze the historical narratives. And why is this so special? Doesn't everybody do that? Well, <gasps> not really. Yeah, that's um, a good question. It is a great question. And, <laughs> and, right. and no, but I mean, it's obvious to us here on the border, but it may not be obvious to, um, yeah, why is this, is this, I don't want to answer for you, but why is epistemic production here on the border being made aware that you are producing your own epistemology? It's important for the people who are often subjects of study to produce their own knowledge. And it goes back to this uh, question of uh, authenticity and uh, being accurate. In order for us to fully understand how these people live, I think it's important for us to allow them to come in and theorize and not just be the subjects of theory itself. Of but the research. Yes, mm -hmm. of research, but allowing them to come in and also produce these uh, theoretical approaches to, to studying uh, any social science. So if we were, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I want to get more concrete than that. Well, the, the bit about agency is important because this is now how philosophy enters back in um, and, my, and some of my concerns with uh, phenomenological ethics. So the ethical dimension of the production of knowledge. The bit about agency is important. So e someone can be an object of study, mm -hmm. right? But in such a way that they don't have any input into how that study is being used or if it's monetized or if it's if they're being exploited in particular, yeah. right? And that's the question of agency. So I have some agency. Or I, I should be educated mm -hmm. to know that I have agency mm -hmm. in, in how that's happening. This, rem this reminds me of um, the interview we did with um, Alex Stein and Mariana Alessandri. They were teaching, they were talking about teaching Gloria Saldua to their students on, you know, in the Rio Grande Valley and how their students reacted to reading the, maybe the first time that they had ever read a book written by a Mexican-American. Yeah. It was always, um, being Mexican, being Mexican-American, we read the books authored by Smith and by Williams and by Johnson, Johnson. right, whatever, yeah. as opposed to Ansaldúa. Mm -hmm. And so it is, uh, this, rem this conversation reminds me of the, the people themselves uh, realizing that he, one of us wrote a book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, another woman it, like me from my, from where right. I was born here, uh, wrote a book, and now I'm reading her book. Mm -hmm. You know, the knowledge production can come from, from here. Yeah. Yeah, and it also influ influences the students. It uh, it allows them, you know, this this representation allows them to, you know, she did it. Hey, I could do this too, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it. Yeah, and that's the that's the other. So you've mentioned a couple of phrases and terms that are really significant. Like, um, well, we asked you about, can you ever be objective, right? But the flip side of that is the importance of this kind of subjective agency, right? That I do have some ability or maybe desire to tell my own story, mm -hmm. right? And so we have this kind of I don't know if there's a tension, but anyway, there's some play between uh, the kinds of stories that are being told and how then they're put down in print or in exhibition or, you know, in a, in, in a mural or a statue like the Conquistador by the airport or the, the, the mural in the museum, mm -hmm. right? So there's that, that kind of play. 
right? So as an educator then, that's something I think that, that you probably have, uh, that you're keenly attentive to, right? Yes. Again, for me, the going back to objective and subjective, uh, radical objectivity and radical subjectivity can be dangerous. Mm. They could both fall into these very dangerous uh, traps. So we have to always find this middle point where we as scholars can remain objective, but also allow for this uh, subjectivity to come in and in, inform our research. And that's something that I also um, am doing with research. I'm um, trying to see how we can bring in lived experience as a methodology to inform our research. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That uh, is awesome. <laughs> for minorities and women, how is learning about their history significant beyond studying the traditional Western narrative? So speaking about, well, I'll just leave it at that. So for minorities and women, how is learning about their history significant beyond studying the traditional Western narrative? So it's extremely uh, important for minoritized people and women to, to study uh, alternatives to the Western narrative, to comprehend how their oppression has been changed through time. And also, I mentioned this earlier, to, for them to understand how to navigate these systems of oppression. and. Again, with, with knowledge, um, the first step to, to liberation is to know and to, to you know, also be knowledgeable of how they've been subjected to atrocities due to the legacies of oppression and colonialism. And how, how the, the, you said uh, how to navigate the, through the systems. Mm -hmm. How does one navigate through the systems, you know, because... It seems like it's, uh, there's no, not much navigation. There, it seems like it's just a, a wall. Yeah. I think education, bump bump. You know, being educated, mm -hmm. knowing uh, how to research, knowing how to you know, study the alternative uh, narratives uh, will allow them to, yes, move around to a system that is constantly subjugating them. Mm-hmm. Um, there now there might not be full liberation, but they'll be able to kind of being aware, being of aware, happening. and move towards more uh, freedom. Well, that, I want to I want to enter in here again because the how is an important one, important question, right? Uh, but there's this kind of specific, um, a very particular role that museums play in our communities. Mm -hmm. Because um, not everybody's going to make it in a classroom. Not everybody's kind of conducive towards mm -hmm. that kind of educational format. But museums are, have, have this more uh, mediating role, if you will, something like that. Yes. Because it, it's, it's um, there's this kind of very physical sense, an embodied sense of our aesthetic experiences, of our lived world experiences, right? But it's not as off-putting as, you know, what I might get theoretically in a classroom. Yeah. You know, so, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I think museums are, how would I say it, less intimidating. Mm -hmm. They offer as a very cohesive uh, type of interpretation that is easily graspable to the general public. In fact, when uh, we write uh, labels for exhibits, we have to write it at a level that the general public will understand. Right. So we could talk about these abstract concepts of these very theoretical and philosophical and uh, historical academic concepts and uh, showing them up where the general public can understand what 
that particular exhibit or that installation or panel is talking about. And I go back to one of the current exhibits that we have, the Pasos Ajenos and Social Justice um, uh, in e and Inequalities in the, in the Borderlands, mm -hmm. is does particularly this right here. So it, it talks about abstract concepts and it brings them down to the level of, of the public. How and long will this one go through? This one is going to run through March. Okay, great. And um, so it's going to run through March. And uh, some educational programming that we have with this, we invited a scholar and a curator from the Chicago History Museum. She'll be at UTEP this Thursday from 3.30 to 5, and she's going to give a lecture on the state of curatorial work for social justice in the Americas and in Europe. And um, she's, she's worked for, her name is Elena Gonzalez. She's, uh, she's curated several exhibits for the National Museum of Mexican American Art. And like I mentioned, she's currently uh, curating an exhibit uh, at the Chicago History Museum. She will connect the art exhibit that we have in the in the museum to her talk and more specifically her book that I t her most recent book I think it just came out in 2019 it's uh, exhibitions for social justice so uh, I invite anyone who wants to go to check it out I wanted you to say a little bit about that and then but I, the next question I'm interested in I think one of the things that museums can do is legitimize the history or that narrative, mm -hmm. whatever it is, right? Whatever, mm -hmm. Because um, because of the main narrative, which is exclusive of other voices, um, when those other voices, pasos ajenos, right? Or when those other voices are on the walls of a museum, it's legitimizing that experience, mm -hmm. um, which you may not get in your history class or in so it's actually very it's different right it's it's very different because to me it's like if it doesn't make it on the syllabus it's almost like it doesn't exist right if it doesn't make it into the table of contents yeah but as a but the museum can put it on the wall and legitimize it yeah yeah and i think also it's important to point out that uh these exhibits, and I like um, pointing this out because I love Pablo Freire. It's it's a it's a it takes a Freudian approach to to understanding uh, their worlds. So it it allows for them to come in with whoever their friends, their 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 fellow classmates, or even their their family members mm -hmm. to come into the museum and look check out the exhibit and then it's a conversation starter it facilitates this dialogue this critical dialogue that you know it enhances you know your your knowledge that gets, gets everybody talking do you want to ask number eight yeah i i well it comes back to yeah I, i'll ask number eight but it comes back to how do you get people into the museum in the first place right um oh, but we can come back to that question uh I can ask. Yeah, go ahead. All right. What do you think, Evan? Do you think that can people of color learn about their history from white people? Or, you know, can women learn about their history from men, right? What does history or philosophy tell us about this? Because it's kind of similar to philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think we all can learn about history from anyone if that person uh, telling the history is willing to be brutally honest and history has shown us to particularly me to be very skeptical to be very careful and to be very critical of these hegemonic narratives that are often you know passing as factual and dictate how my life is so i going back to that i think that yes we can learn history from anyone as long as they are brutally honest yeah that's oh. an interesting thing because one of the reasons why plato 
wanted to outlaw the poets and arts from the city, from the Republic, it was because he felt that, that the poets and the artists couldn't be brutally honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so therefore you couldn't have a just city. Mm -hmm. You know, because they would make things up about the gods yeah. or about the events. They'd twist the, yeah. how the events went and things like that. So I think your example of this kind of counter um, mural to the colonial mural is a really good example of how one, ca one can promote an honest response, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to one that's Brutal, um, brutal honesty. Then yes. is the, the requirement. That's what it is. Yeah. It today. doesn't mean that just because I'm brown, I can teach brown people about yeah. brown history. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So I may not be honest. For all we know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's kind of a, an ethical, ethical imperative there, that. Um, that has to contend with uh, competing, competing interests. Oh yeah, right. Yep. And so. it goes back to you know whether it's ideological or political or you know economical. Uh, whether, for example, if we they ask us to do an exhibit on some sort of scientific discovery, and they're willing to give us a lot of money for it and we have to cover up a lot of unethical uh, data gathering data gathering or the processes that these scientists did you know it goes back to this ethical question uh, should we do it or should we legitimize should, it should right? we le legitimize it yeah that's it right there yeah mm -hmm. because what you're doing with a museum is you're putting things up on a wall or in a space and if it's objective if it's there then somehow this is how it is. Mm -hmm. This is the reality, yeah. right? Yeah. Without really understanding the forces or the dynamics that brought it about. Brought it yeah. about, right? Yeah. What is your favorite border figure or historical event from the border, and why? So <clears throat> I may sound a little cliche, but we mentioned her earlier, or you mentioned her earlier. But I think uh, my favorite. Um, Border figure would be Gloria Anzaldúa. I think that she's my favorite one because she's a Chicana pioneer who started applying these philosophical concepts to studying the border. And it's it's also good to point out that she is often labeled as a cultural th theorist and not a philosopher, mm -hmm. but she is a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And she's perhaps one of the first ones who started applying these uh, philosophical concepts and being critical of, of border studies. And perhaps she launched this new approach on critical border studies that now a lot of scholars are moving towards um, analyzing the border through this uh, approch. I have a, a follow-up question. You said that she's often labeled as a cultural theorist and not a philosopher. Who labels her and why? <laughs> so again, we go back to the meta-narrative. It's that meta-narrative that is informing on who gets to pass as a philosopher and not a philosopher, particularly because she was a brown lesbian woman. She cannot be a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And why? Well, because the meta-narrative is still very racist and very structured to favor men, white men. The the main his the, the yeah who, right yeah. the traditional the mm -hmm. narrative okay. Yeah. Let's t let's um, stay with this and talk about the importance of the place of the museum. Mm -hmm. You know that this museum occupies a place in our land here, right? And specifically, um, it's in the center of an educational institution, for one. Mm -hmm. uh, but secondly, um, it's in a city that is predominantly brown, mm -hmm. predominantly Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Chicanx, right? 
And so do you find your responsibility, um, how do you see your responsibility as an educational curator in a museum like that, in a place like this, vis-a-vis -vis this dominant hegemonic, mm -hmm. if we may say, um, asphyxiating. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It's, it kind of chokes off the potential for like normal rhythmic breathing, you know, breathing in how we should be as opposed to, you know, the kind of polluted air that that gets sent our way. But, you know, I think it's important to talk about the place of the museum and our awareness of its place. We mentioned the, you know, the Rio Grande Valley, but El Paso is an important place. And to have a museum like that and a job like yours, you know, comes with a lot of responsibility. Comes with tons of responsibility. I find it extremely important that as an educational curator, mm -hmm. I, and not only as an educational curator, but as a cultural specialist, specifically for this region, mm -hmm. I want to enhance the voices of the way the museum, you know, curates the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so the museum, is, uh, was built in 1936. It was in commemoration of the centennial um, of the Texas independence. Mm -hmm. So we have moved from celebrating Texas to now celebrating the voices of the border and the Chihuahuan Desert. So I want to now, especially at an at a educational institution, the biggest educational institution in this region uh, that primarily serves 85% um, Hispanic demographic or Mexican-American, to portray the stories, uh, again, going back to accuracy, as accurately as I can of the people here and the exhibitions that we try to do. Yeah, because there's, so I, I think this is a really um, interesting, a really interesting point that you bring up that the museum was founded by, based on the centennial of the celebration of the independence of Texas, where, you know, from what we've been talking about all afternoon now is, is um, how do we, how do you, how do museums cultivate a kind of critical independent perspective on spectators and people who come to the museum, right? Mm -hmm. These are the, these meta narratives. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting sort of phenomenon that's going on about one independence, you know, countering another yeah. independence, right? Yeah. You know, so that there's, I mean, it just, you know, for me, it heightens that kind of responsibility factor. It yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah, because um, the, the independence of Texas, Texas came about through a whole lot of oppression, mm -hmm. you know, flat out. <laughs> so this is this, these tensions, these mm -hmm. political tensions, right? And the special and role that educational asking, institutions uh, and museums are about. Yeah, how do you navigate your way through the systems? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think so, Evan, you've lived on, studied, and now work here on the border, right? And so you've studied our history from multiple perspectives um, with your border studies background. Do you think it's possible for humans in general to live in peace? What's your take on on? Uh, I I wish I had that the answer for that, and I truly don't know. Mm -hmm. But being here at the border and studying the border the way I do. We are 83% Hispanic or identify as Mexican American. And we've been seeing this influx of migrants from Central and South America. And the common rhetoric on the, on the streets uh, coming from us Hispanics is that they really don't want these migrants here. 
In fact, our local government has been busing these migrants to other major cities instead of providing resources. But I do think that education uh, allows us for uh, us to find ways on how to create peace and live in peace. But it, it'll, I, I would sound naive if I would say that education single-handedly can solve all our problems. But I am hopeful. But we're still at it. Yes. We're going to keep trying. We're going to keep trying. Yeah, and so we come back to, um, you know, how do you get, how do you attract people to come to museums? And it's a, it's an important question because you have the opportunity with the museum to provide these counter narratives mm -hmm. and these responses and raise issues and questions, right? But if in fact, you know, what's going on in the streets is that we're not offering them pan dulce and apple cider. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're offering bus tickets yeah. to Chicago or New, New York, York or, you know, or, or Washington, D.C. even, right? Um, it almost seems like a betrayal. One of the vital sorts of, of responses that our community can make to this issue, this immigration issue. How is it a betrayal? Well, because we, um, rather than welcoming El Paso is sending off more buses of immigrants than any other community in the whole uh, border oh, region. I, okay. Oh. You know, just like yeah. Evan said, you know, people on the street just are not responding in a way that is is addressing the the, the r very serious problems of challenges of the immigration issues. We're not uh, maybe we're not stepping up to the plate. It's a missed opportunity. It's an opportunity we as a community are missing. We're not stepping up to the plate, and not only that, we, you know, we could be more welcoming, you know, and find ways to address what's going on, mm -hmm. um, rather than just pushing it's the problem. It's not my problem. Yeah. yeah, it's not my problem, that kind of thing. You know, this reminds me of, um, of asking you your perspective on on this question, because um, we're talking about meta narratives and alternative um, perspectives, so um, Indigenous Peoples Day is today, and but this is a new development. For the longest time, it was called Columbus Day. Why, uh, why the change, and how come it took that long? How many centuries? Fourteen ninety-two. <laughs> Right. So I, five hundred years. I believe that people are becoming more aware of their history, and the atrocities that colonialism brought. But to say that everyone celebrates Indigenous People Day, I don't think so. I think slowly states are acknowledging this, uh, th this Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Peoples Day, but not all states are on board. Um, I think some one of the movements that detonated this was the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. um, in 2020 when they killed George Floyd. I remember seeing uh, you know statues topple down, and this ha this goes back to you know people being more aware of of this meta narrative and how to counter it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good reference point, statues being toppled down. Because what do you find in a lot of museums? <coughs> Paintings and statues. And statues yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, it's been wonderful having you here, Evan. Yes. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, and to get, to get this opportunity to talk about what's involved in being a, a, an educational curator, curator of education yes. at a museum. Thank you. Thank you. And this has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. My name is Kim Diaz. My name is Jules Simon, and please check out some of our other um, episodes at EPCC TV. Join us next time.